It didn't have a, a red light. Anyway, everything is chock full of stuff. And I still, I still threw this word on the word of the day. Um, like I said, like I tell you, I always give you the words as they come right out of the text. Lambate, which is um, uh, lambano. The form is lambano. Lambete is, lambano is, um, is a verb. It means to take, take. And I think you saw, I want to, I want to go back over that verse again that we kind of hit at the end of the last class because that will show you the, what it is. This means, this only means in Greek to take, okay? It tends to be translated receive. But it is a very, very strong verb to mean to grasp with your hand. Lambano, Rick, does it have an antecedent? I don't think so. But it's really funny, and, and I gave you the different words that it's translated as, but it, it, is, it really cannot be translated as a word that is um, uh, not aggressive. It's, it is a very aggressive word in Greek. This, these two words are really, really misunderstood, I think. They're not ever translated very well, but let's see if we can kind of gather their meaning from them. Um, T-O-M-A-T-A. Parapetoma, parapetomata, but paratoma. Let's see. Para means, well, everybody knows, right here, near, near. And I expect you to know, toma, uh, patoma. Patoma means fall, near fall. And this word tends to be translated. Let me see. Do I have a list of translated words? Um, trans be translated fall, fall, offense, trespass. But it literally means to fall aside. Now, this is not a common word for meaning. Remember, what is the word? Do you guys remember right offhand the word for uh, sin in Greek? Hermatia? Hermatia. Yes, which means? To miss the mark. To miss the mark. Right, exactly. But instead, Mark gives us peritoma, which means near fall. Near fall from what? Or away from what? The, the path, away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hodos. You know, this is really interesting, and so we, you know, if I really wanted a word to mean sin, right, in the sense of the Greek, it's to miss the mark, but it, and that's consistent across Pauline letters in the gospel, but in Mark, I get this word parapetoma, which means to near fall, in other words, to fall out of the way, but you're not so far out of the way you can't return, right, do you get it? And this word, you know, it is translated almost universally to sin. But I'm not so sure it's quite as cut and dried as that. Because what did Jesus tell them? You know, I, I guess we'll go back to Matthew, because I don't think it was quite as clear in Mark, although he, I think he is as clear in Mark, but not so clear to our sensibilities. But what did he tell them about the Torah and the Torah law in Matthew? And in John, in uh, Luke, by the way. They're eternal, right? They never change. They they always exist. The, the assumption of Christ is that the Torah law is. And so the way you fall, uh, the way you sin from the Torah law is by breaking the Torah, right? Well, I don't know what this means exactly. I mean, I don't think Jesus is particularly talking about breaking the Torah law. Now, he could be. It could be wrapped in that. But he's talking about falling out of the way. But close enough that you can recover, be recovered. So we'll see that in context. I just want you to, to remember that because I'm not, I'm not going to say I don't understand what Jesus means. I think I can get it, but I think it's not exactly what we perceive it to be. But let's, we'll see what it says in the, in the, in the gospel. Um, this word is connected directly to it. A P H I E T E. Afiete. Uh, the word is Athene. It comes from Athene. Athene. And you notice these are almost all verbs. Uh, this specifically means it comes from the participle apo, which means off. Off. 
and Himi, uh, which means, let's see, and Himi to sin, to send off, to send away. Um, again, you know, not a, a super strong word, but yet it's translated almost always. And look what it's translated as. Uh, this is interesting. Cry, forgive, forsake, lay aside, leave, let, omit, put away, remit, suffer, and yield up. You know, the translator himself is not exactly certain of this word, or, or it's how the word itself should be translated. Do you see where the problem might be with some of these words? I mean, if you translate them in a very strong sense, what have you done? You set in place an idea or thought that may or may not be part of that word at all. And so let's see how this fits, because that's the point. We are we are in the temple, we have been to the temple. And in 19, this is 11, 19, when the evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning they went along and they saw the fig tree. Remember the fig tree withered from the roots? And I told you, what we had is we had. We had the fig tree that was cursed. Then we went to Jerusalem, and then we had the fig tree again. And you know, it is obvious that the fig tree, well, we're going to find out exactly what the fig tree represents, precisely. But you can guess the fig tree represents Israel and Jerusalem or something like that. Yeah? The translation, the problem they have with the translation, is it because the ancient Greek was lost, or why would they have so much trouble with the translation? They have problems with the translation because they're setting theology in place instead of translating the words for us so that we can ourselves make a determination about what Jesus is saying. But would the Greeks have had trouble understanding or understanding what he meant when he used that word? Not, not at all. Not, not in, except, except. Remember, we have seen how a lot of what Jesus says are paradoxes. And the Greeks would revel in it. Because in a paradox, you don't know what the answer is. I mean, the answer stems from intellect or stems from thought, you see. And that's the, you know, that's the whole life of this Greek thing, that the Greeks are looking at, you know, the, to the Greek, this logos to tell us is that's, that's it. That is their, that to them is like what to us is, you know, when you go talk, when you, when you, when, well, when ladies talk, they always do their lady things, right? And they talk about, you know, what they're doing and what they're, you know. And when men talk, what do you do? You tell stories, right? To the Greeks, the logos to tell us is their conversation. It is their way of speaking to one another in intellectual, in, in not just intellectual conversation, in all conversation. Everything you're looking at is a logos to tell us. Um, we would find it different because our culture is different. But yet when you tell, you know, when I tell a story, to the guys, right? I'm trying to tell a cohesive story, and you say, well, well, how can you do that? Well, of course I can do that, because that's our culture, right? We know how to tell a story. That's what we're, right? As children, you're trained to tell stories. Well, what do children in Greek societies get? Text today. They get logos to tell us, right? They get a, a substable, right? So guess what? They are always telling stories without a punchline. They never tell the punchline. And so the expectation is that you get the punchline. And, you know, if you don't, you know, I love that. You know, he, he who laughs last thinks slowest, right? So in the Greek worldview, you know, probably everybody's smiling because they hope they get the punchline. Stand-up comedians must have been a real drag then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you can see that the point is this, that, you know, in their way of thinking, in their culture, you know, they are being presented ideas. And the point of the ideas, though, is you don't miss them, right? Because the speaker who, who can't, can't provide a logos that's, that you can figure out is what? A bad speaker, right? That's the whole point of the logos is that you're supposed to get it. The, the telos is unspoken, but you get, you get it, right? And so I... I'll tell you flat out, the Greeks knew what he was saying. Even when they had a paradox, they understood the paradox. The paradox being, he didn't give an answer that was forthright, that was, you know, that had ambivalent answers, unless he gives a parable. In a par when it says it's a parabola, a parable, it always has one telos. 
has to. A paradox, by definition, can have more than one para uh, more than one telos. See, but generally, the point of the Greek is to lead you into the thought. So, we have Peter remembering to Jesus, Labbi, look, the fig tree you curse is withered. And we talked about that. But what is important that I want you to note are the next verses. Because in 22, Jesus says, listen very carefully. Have persuasion, have pistis in God. Have persuasion in God. Peter said, he lego. Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus says, have persuasion in God. What did Jesus just say? What is the tell us of that statement? I think somebody said it last week. If, if, I, if I curse a fig tree, and the fig tree is cursed, and then you note, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And then I say to you, have persuasion in God. What did I just tell you? I'm God. I'm God. That is a direct Greek statement that Jesus just told Peter and all the others. I'm God. Now, the reason that Peter didn't have to say that is why? It's obvious. If a guy, if, if a guy, if a person, okay, goes, if, if a person comes and let's say there's a plant in here, I don't see a living plant, but there's a plant in here, and I and I'm right there, and I tell you, you're cursed, you'll never bear fruit again. And the next day we come in, and you see that it's withered. Now you could say that maybe I poured. Uh, uh, what's that? You know, what's that stuff they put on on plants to kill? Roundup, you know, uh, round yeah, on it and killed it, right? I mean, that's possible. But the point is that that shows that would show supernatural, and especially with the comment that Jesus made, he just proclaimed himself God. This is that Greek logos to telos thing. It's an unstated telos, but it's obvious from the logos. That is part of the reason for the fig, you know, the curse from the fig tree that the. the Allegory. It's an allegory of the fig tree. But there's more to it. Let's go on. So my question. Let's go on. 23. I tell you the truth. Anyone who says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt. And the word is diacrino, to separate thoughtfully in his cardia, but pisteo, but is convinced what he lelo will happen. It will be done for him. What he lego, it will be done for him. And remember, yes, last time we looked at, we said this is the mountain is Zeus, the sea is Poseidon. You can take this literally, but this is not a literal. In, in English, we see these as things, but we know what Jesus thinks about things already, right? Things are not. If you're if you're in things, you're not in the kingdom of heaven. So these are events, and the reason I wanted to build up to this is because of what happens next, where we stopped last time. Because Jesus is not talking about things, he's talking about events. And look what he says. Therefore I lego you, this is 24, whatever you ask for in proskomai, which means worship, pisteo, pisteo, be convinced that you have lambano, that you lambano, that you do what? You grasp it. In other words, in other words, see, in our English sense, we think, I tell the mountain, go mountain, and the mountain jumps into the sea. That's what is Jesus saying? How do you take the mountain to the sea? You can do it figuratively or literally. How do I do it literally? One handful at a time. Yeah, one handful at a time are explosives, exactly. The point of this isn't, Jesus isn't saying, you go, hey God, make the mountain go into the sea. And, and the mountain just, you know, appears and drops in the sea. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's saying that you are praying to God, and if you think the mountain should be in the sea, because that's what God's telling you should happen, 
then you go take the mountain, shovel full by shovel full, and put it in the sea. That is a thing kind of idea, but that's direct Greek consequence. On the other hand, figuratively, if we're talking about Zeus and Poseidon, what is he saying? What are you changing to make the mountain go to the sea? Well, you're taking command over them. Yes. You are putting your mind in command over them. Your mind. In the same way that, for example, the way I would take my mind and put command over the, over the mountain, over the mountain and I dig it up, <laughs> right? It might take my whole life. It might take my whole life. But I do it. I, I heard something, and you know, this is a direct reflection. Remember Jesus told us, uh, take up your cross, your execution at stake, and follow me? I heard some lady who was supposed to be a Christian say on the radio, Jesus didn't intend for us to suffer. Yeah, I had the same impression. You know, a guy who tells you to take your execution at stake and carry it with him <laughs> intends for you to suffer big time, right? How can you not imagine that the same guy who says that would tell you, take the mountain to the sea, if you think that's the thing to do? And by the way, guess what Jesus is telling them to do with Zeus and Poseidon? Take the mountain to the sea, right? It may be as difficult as literally taking the mountain. Why? What do the Greeks revere? The gods. The gods. The gods are everything. So the way to get bury the gods is you take the mountain to the sea. You literally bury the gods in themselves. You kill them. That's what he's saying. This is a logos to tell us, beautiful logos to tell us, an implication, like I said, in Greek that is very obvious to the Greeks. Let's continue because it continues. 25. And when you steko have stood proskomai, in worship, not praying, in worship, if you aphimi, if, look what they translate this word as, aphimi. I told you aphimi means to send off, to send forth. But they just translated hold. If you send forth anything against anyone, a femi him. I didn't re put it in there, but the forgive is a femi. Think about this. Think about this. What is Jesus talking about? If I if 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 I send forth, send off, what am I sending off? A negative thought, a bad thought, a bad idea about someone. Anything, anything against anyone. Not forgive him. Send off what? The bad thought. The idea, right? He's not telling you to forgive people at all. This isn't about forgiving. This is if you have a bad thought. Remember Jesus said, if you're in going to the sacrifice, what are you supposed to do before you sacrifice? Put your sacrifice down. Go find the one you have a bad thought against and resolve it. Make it right before you sacrifice. Exactly. This is a this is exactly the same kind of thought. The only difference is remember the audience is Greek and Roman. So in a Greek and Roman idea, you know, even though Matthew probably was writing to Greek and Roman, and in, in Matthew and Luke it's specific, it says if you have a, if you're going to sacrifice and you have something against your brother, then first resolve with your brother before you sacrifice. This is the intellectual equivalent of that in Greek thought. So when you're worshiping and you hold something against, you sin for it. You have an idea, something bad. You know, it's not a question of forgiveness. And look what it says. So that your Father in heaven may send forth your peritotoma. Deviations is probably a really good word for this. It's your near falling out of the hodos. Near falling, the, the assumption here isn't that you're apostate, that isn't you that you are going against the Torah, but rather you are you have fallen away in what? What is the specific thing you're falling away from? What is what is the problem? The path. What's that? The path. Well, the path meaning what? Your pistis. You're convinced, you're convinced, right? I, you know, Jesus calls for you to be convinced, right? The convincing. So, you know, it happens to everyone, right? Every now and then, I'm not convinced. I think, wow, is this Jesus thing real, right? You think, everybody thinks that, right? That's near falling. That's what he's talking about. I'm not convinced. 
The problem with not being convinced is, remember what Jesus said? Who can go to the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven? No one without God. You know, children can go to the kingdom of heaven. Those who have no stuff can go to the kingdom of heaven, right? But we can't go to the heaven, kingdom of heaven without God. So all this is fits within this beautiful thing. What we've done by making it a question of sin and forgiveness is we have really, you know, we've taken a beautiful paradox, a beautiful Greek kind of, um, I'm not going to say squishy, it's not squishy. What Christ is trying to do is, this is encouragement, right? What is it if I read it the way it's written right here? What is it? It's a condemnation, right? On the other hand, what Jesus is trying to do is give an encouragement. Encour not, he's not telling you, well, if you don't forgive your sins, God won't forgive you. Right? If you don't forgive others. What he's trying to tell you is, look, don't have bad thoughts against your brothers. Well, so many people read this and they think, well, my prayers, I must not be doing it right because what I asked for isn't happening. You know, and, and you know, it says, you know, if you have... So, that, so you begin to question people. This really rocks a lot of people's faith about their prayer life or what that's going on when they pray because mountains aren't moving for them. Well, the mountains aren't moving because guess what? They aren't moving the mountains. They're sitting back and waiting for it to happen. Yeah, yeah, they're sitting back. See, the word in Lambano is not receive it. It's, it's not to be received. It's to take it. Seize it. Yeah. You know, see, this is that, this is a huge fight, in my opinion. The Sarks, we're going back to this Sarks world. The Tsuke Panuma. You know, the world of the Greeks and the world of the Hebrews is a Sarks world. It's what I feel. It's my faith. It's, it'll happen to you no matter what, right? It's all feelings. Jesus and Paul and the whole New Testament is telling them, feelings don't matter. What matters is your thoughts. The thoughts are what change, like, you know, what Jesus says right now. If you have something against your brother, or if you, if you think a thought against your brother, send it away. It doesn't mean anything, right? Don't, it doesn't matter. Just like if you have a slight deviation, like everyone does, you, you have a, a, a problem of will, of thought, where you think suddenly, wow, maybe I'm not in the right way, maybe I'm not convinced, or maybe I'm not convinced enough. See what he's saying? We think that mountains will be moving, it means we're convinced enough. That's what Jesus says. If you're convinced enough, you'll do what? You'll move the mountain. See? You'll do something about it. Right? This reminds me, remember in Lassie? Anybody read Lassie? I think it was Lassie, where the, the, the old farmer told the kid to pray out loud to, you know, oh, I really want a dog. And after about two or three weeks, his dad finally bought him a dog. Right? Because the kid kept praying out loud, and the dad heard it, and he finally couldn't stand it any longer. And he said, well, I'm going to buy you a dog. So that, I think that was Lassie. It was one of those kid books. But in any case, the point is that, you know, well, even Jesus said that, right? Said about prayer, you know, keep going to your Father, you know, keep asking. But the point of asking is what? That you eventually take action. You know, like for example, I'll pray all day that my, my neighbor hears the gospel, right? What does that mean I should do? Go tell him. Yeah, yeah. So, so I could pray all day. He never hears the gospel his whole life, and he dies and goes to hell. Oh, well, that's a great thing, right? I think somebody's going to have a real problem there, right? And it's, it's well, the, your neighbor will, but maybe you will too. Uh, anyway, it's just this word. You know, these words, I think, are very important. Um, it's always a uh, <clears throat> continual battle in the mind as well, and that's what he's the mind is always taking you over here, and you got to fight with that to get back on the path. Beautiful. That's, that is a precise thought. That is exactly right. And I think, you know, within the Greek, you know, if we were to draw a picture of that, you know, that here's the way, 
And Jesus, you know, God, Jesus knows you're going to step out of the way. But remember, we're optios. So our point is, you know, Jesus is leading. He's a centurion. And all the rest of us are optios. I mean, that's what he kept telling his disciples. You know, stop leading. The way you're supposed to do is you're helping people, right? You're not leading. I'm leading. But you're helping. You're helping people along the way. And guess what? If you're helping people along the way, how, how far are you going to fall out? Not, far. not too far. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. The, some of this stuff is just so beautiful. You know, in the Greek, it, I think the Greek is so beautiful in the way it's expressed. Let's continue. In 20, uh, by the way, 26 is not in your, in your NIV. So I want to make sure that we had it because it is in the King James. And it is in the Greek. If you do not send forth, if you do not send forth, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, send forth your parapetoma. Now, if I read this, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. That's a threat. On the other hand, if I say, if you do not send forth, neither will your Father in heaven send forth your deviations. It's a whole different way of thinking, isn't it? Very different. Because we're not talking about breaking, we're not talking about sin and breaking the law. We're talking about you having thoughts about other people that are not good. Let it go. Let it go. Now that's not to say, remember the continual message about true forgiveness? There's, there's another message about true forgiveness. And, that, and repentance. When we talk about forgiveness and repentance, a whole other thing. Maybe we'll get into that later, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that for now because we'll move on. So is that completely left out of the NIV? Yeah. They, it's, the it's kicked out of the NIV, but it is in the Greek. Um, I I think they kicked it out because it saw it as repetitious, but it's, it's not necessarily repetitious if you look at it within the context we are looking at it. Um, you know... Forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness are a huge deal. This is not repentance and forgiveness. They translate it for us that way, but it, the word, do these words, does this word mean sin? No, not even in the Greek. No Greek would say this means sin. And does this mean to forgive? No Greek would say it means to forgive. Well, the Lord's Prayer has that same concept. And is it thought of... Like, you think of this? Not, not the same words. Not the same words. That is a problem we continually have. Just like Lambano is, is almost routinely... It, it, uh, what it, Lambano. Lambano can only be translated to take. But it is translated um, as accept, be amazed, assay, attain, bring, when I call, catch, come on, forget. Have, hold, obtain, receive, take. Well, what does it say in the Lord's Prayer? I'd have to look it up, but it's not. The word is, um, harmatia is trespasses. So that's, that really is sin. Okay? And the word, um, I'd have to look it up, but I do not believe it's atheri. I'd have to look up the word specifically. Mary. Do I have time? Can I? I have it right here. Let's see what word it is. If I got it right off hand. We're talking about Matthew. Anybody remember Matthew? Exactly Matthew. Six. Six. Yeah, it's Matthew six. It's during the yeah. things. Let's see. Uh, Matthew, Matthew six. <coughs> Matthew. Matthew six. Lord's prayer six five. Lord's prayer um, six five. Um, I don't have my. This is this is pure Greek. Um, Aftov, Afton, 
Upton, uh, let's see, and what is it used for trespasses? I'm showing debt, debtors. Debtors, I'm looking at the, what's the Greek say? Um, O-P-H-E-T-A-I-S. <laughs> um, um, uh, -E uh. See, we studied Matthew before. And we went through this before. But the words, the, the trespasses, the sin, it uses sin off for forgive. But the word is not as strong, which may be, you know, anyone ever been confused by the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Uh -huh. What is he exactly saying? We probably need to do Matthew again, or at least make it, may move up to Luke or something so we can see. Well, Luke doesn't have the Lord's Prayer either. Um, only Matthew has the Lord's Prayer. And the Didache. So we're looking at the Dache and see what it has exactly. But send off is not the same as forgive. The, the word for forgive, and I don't know it right offhand, we've seen it before, and we may re-encounter it because it's really different. What we're talking about, you know, in Jesus' assumption, the, the assumption of Jesus is what about the Torah? And we're all following it, right? That, that you're following the Torah. The problem isn't the Torah. What's the problem? That's the problem. We missed one. Well, the problem is the 36 things. Number, the, the problem with the Torah is that if you do any of it intentionally, what happens? You can't be forgiven. Even the sacrifices can't forgive you if you've done it intentionally. But the problem is the 36 stuff that Paul writes about in, in uh, Acts, or that, uh, yeah, Luke writes about, about Paul in Acts, the 36 unforgivable. There's 36 unforgivable, and, and the, in the 36 unforgivable are the 10, the 10 commandments, the 10 words, all right, with the other Torah commandments. But if you did it intentionally, there's no forgiveness. That's the problem. So, you know, it, it's not so much the, the ten words that's the problem. As a matter of fact, by Greek, by the Jewish thought, if I touch a denarius, what have I just done? Touch a graven image. I, I have, I have a, and I, if I own it, I have a graven image. Yeah, I know. Right? What are you going to do about it? And, and if you intentionally, if I bought something with it or, or paid with it, what did I just do? I intentionally did it, right? I have a serious problem. So, you know, this is a little deeper than we want to think about stuff, right? That we have been led to believe about stuff, right? So anyway, I, I wish I had time to go over the whole of the Lord's Prayer because I didn't, you know, prepare that. But if you remember in Matthew, we went through that. And we actually what, saw what did the temple coin have on it? The temple coin, that is a great question. Usually it had trees. Well, why isn't that a graven image? Because the assumption of a graven image is that it would be of a person. It, when it's a person, it's definitely a god. If it's an animal, see, because that represented the sacrifice. So you skate with a plant? They would skate with a plant. So lots of the stuff would have plants. And they also would have, um, let's see, what else would they have on them? The temple coinage? What was they would have plants. Plants yeah. tend to be a thing. Um, and there's something else they'd have. They wouldn't have columns. Columns were, you know, columns were, were um, phallic symbols. Yeah, so you, you definitely wouldn't have col columns. You wouldn't have columns in buildings. Ooh, that'd be bad. Or people, see. But they would, you know, they, they'd skate with plants and they had something else. I knew they have, like, they have problems with words, too. You have to be careful about words. It, sound, the, it, it sounds was, like capitalism at work to me. The temple put something on and said that's okay. Hey, we're going to find out the direct, because the direct comes in here. Um, this, this is not a change of logos. This is not a change of logos. But we have a change of venue. 27. When they arrived again in Jerusalem... And while Jesus was Parapato walking all around in the harem, in the sacred place, 
Quartz was added, by the way. The Archias, the chief priests, and how many chief priests are there supposed to be? One. one. But remember, I told you before, since the Romans came in, they kept having a new one every year because the Romans were pretty tricky about that. They would make a new high priest, so that way it would keep the people from, because of a constant problem they had before. What did the Rome, what did the Greeks or what did the Hebrews keep doing? They kept declaring their priests Messiah. Messiah and King, and then they have a big war, right? So they're smart. We'll change them every year. That way they can't build a faction. And that's what they did. So we had Caiaphas, Ananias, and there were new ones all the time. And uh, this also allowed them to... Who was the high priest supposed to be? From the lineage of Aaron, right? He was supposed to be the, the head guy, the head patriarch in the lineage of Aaron at the time. More or less whoever had the money. So, well, it, that that's what was happening, because they had a problem after the diaspora. Herod destroyed what? You might remember from Josephus? Records. He destroyed all the records. And so they were still in the minds of the people, so they still knew who they were. But this was a problem, and they had this problem coming back from the diaspora, because the records were destroyed by Herod, Herod the Great. And about, uh, he died in what, <coughs> five, four or five AD? So... He had destroyed the records because why did he destroy the records? Because he was an Edomite. He was an Edomite, see? And and no Edomite was supposed to be in the temple for three generations or ten generations or ever. No, no Edomite was supposed to be ever in the temple. So by destroying the records, he he made himself a Jew. And he could then go into the temple, which, you know, anyway. Um, they arrived, and they had the, the chief priests and the grammateus. Again, you know, Mark uses this word, grammateus, which is a scribe. And it's translated usually teaches the law. We've talked about this before. And the elders, the prospera, uh, uh, presbyteros. The presbyteros. When, they, when you see elders, that means, who does that mean? Leaders of the church. The Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Yeah, somebody said it's the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin came to him. Okay, so I, we got all the guy, main guys. Mark, the Grammatea scribes uh, may or may not be Pharisees. The, this is interesting because remember, it, Mark talks about Pharisees. So we don't have any Pharisees in this group, but we have Sanhedrin. Most of Sanhedrin are Sadducees, right? Because the priests. There are only four of the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin at this time that we know of. Um, and the chief priests. So they got the chief priests, the minor priests, the Sanhedrin, and probably the lay writers, which are probably Levites, but that's Somewhat okay. Of a crowd, it would seem. By what authority? Remember, this this is a continuation of the logos. What did Jesus do between in the fig tree incident? Yeah, but what did he do between the fig tree being cursed and dying? Went into Jerusalem. He, he cleared out the temple. He kicked them out and would not allow them to carry any sacrificial stuff across the temple area. So he prevented commerce. Um, by what authority, what exusa, exusa, remember that's a Roman term, privilege, are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you the authority to do this? Do you see why this is a continuation logo? What did Jesus tell, just tell them that he was? God. God. So we already know the punchline, right? Whose house is it? Yeah, well, we know the punchline. So, by what authority? This is uh, the continuation of the Lego about the stuff in the temple. Okay, so, what authority and who gave you the authority? You notice, just fits right in. So, 16. Or, let's see, why do I have 16 in here? I have 16 in here. What is 16? 29. Oh, uh, 16 is where it said, it would not allow people to carry. That's what we just looked at. The merchandise, the schools through the temple. 29. Jesus replied, and the word is apkromai. He made up his own mind, and he echoed. He said, I will erapateo. I will ask you one logos. I will ask you one logos. Answer, apochromai, conclude for yourself to me, and I will arrow, I will tell you by what exusa I am doing these things. Why, why does he have to tell them? He already did. Well, he's not going to tell them. Well, part of the problem is cultural. We, this is a Greek document written by a Greek guy to Greeks and Romans. 
Greek-speaking people. <coughs> the guys in the temple, he just told you, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, and the writers of the Talmud, basically the Levites. They're all what kind of thinkers? Hebrew. They're Hebrew Jewish thinkers. They're rabbinic thinkers. I don't have time to go through the rabbinic stuff, you know, today. But you know, they're thinking rabbinically. They're not thinking Greekly, right? They want to tell us. They want they want an express telos, but they really don't want an express telos. What do they really want? What does a rabbi, Greek or a Jewish thinker want? Wanting to commit blasphemy. What well, what do they really want? Yeah, they want a discussion. It, they, there's no telos. There's no logos in the sense of the Greek logos. They want a discussion that involves the Torah and the Talmudic documents. And the Mishnah. Now remember, the Sadducees are, are not, they're anti talmud right? They're anti mishnah and Talmud. So they would not, they're not, not conversant in it. They would expect a good Pharisee to bring it up. And they think Jesus is what? A, a good Pharisee, right? Because he's from the school of the Galil. So, you know, of course this Jesus guy is a, you know, a rabid Pharisee, and he's going to bring up. So we're ready for him, Right? But yeah, they, they don't look for a logos or a telos. They're not looking for this Greek thinking that's straight out. They want a discussion. They want to dialogue a little bit, you know. Let, let's just dialogue a bit, you know. And, and then, you know, we'll come to a conclusion based on the dialogue in the Torah. That's, that's their thing, right? That's what they say. So Jesus completely throws them for a loop. But what he did is do what? He just put them into the... The Greek worldview, the Greek view, a logos. Let's have a logos. I'll give you a logos, and then I'll tell you why I'm doing these things. They're not used to it. So this is what he says in 30. John's baptism, immersion, literally the immersion, the baptisma, the immersion. Was it from Aranos or from Anthropos? In other words, was it from the heavens? Was it from, tell me. And the word is really cool. It's it's an emphatic in Greek. It's akromai moi. Tell me. You know, a demand. It's really cool. He gives him a Greek question, a logos, and he expects him to give him. Well, in the Greek, would would they are they expected to give the telos? They they could they could. There's nothing wrong in a Greek argument. This is a Socratic argument, right? Just like when Jesus asked the disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Right? And they answered him. Direct answer. That's okay. That's Greek. That's Socratic method. That's okay. That's a, because I'm not. I'm the teacher, but I'm not staying to tell us. Who's staying to tell us? You are. The learner is staying to tell us. So that means you got it, right? So look what they do. He posed him a Greek question, and he went directly to John, the mikvah. They dialogizai. They reckoned thoroughly. So they're sitting there yakking together in their pile, right? Among themselves and Lego to themselves. This is Lego to themselves. So obviously they weren't quiet about it. You know, this is the way it is. If we Epo from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you pasteo? Why weren't you persuaded by him? 32. But if we say from men, Anthropos, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was the prophet. And obviously this is happening. All right. Can you pic picture this? All right. Now, Greek text will not tell you everything that's happening around it, because they assume you can figure it out for yourself. So Jesus kicked everybody out of the, you know, would not allow any merchandise to move. So what do you think is happening right now? These guys are furious. Well, they're furious, but, but who's in the large, temple? There's a large crowd, because this has never happened before. Bingo! There's, there's a huge crowd, because this Jesus guy, number one, remember he was coming up from Jericho, and, and was there a small group following? No. no. There, were, there were a throng following up from Jericho. So all these people came up from Jericho in the Pilgrim Festival, probably for the Passover, who knows. And they're all in Jerusalem, and they're expecting to buy their... There's sacrificial lambs, right? There's a whole bunch of people, and Jesus is sitting there preventing them from moving merchandise. 
And all the Sanhedrin, all the guys have come, and the temple ain't working. The temple stopped. There is an enormous crowd, and the place is full. The, the, uh, all the, you know, the court of Gentiles is probably full of Gentiles. And guess what? You know, if you read my book, Centurion, you'll know that the Roman legion is in the, the uh, palace of Anatonia, and they're watching this. And they probably have legions down there, groups, at least someone down there, keeping an eye on things. Because there's a million people in Jerusalem for the Passover and for the Passover festivals, the pilgrim festivals. So there is a, there, there's a real issue here, right? And there's people all around. And, you know, even them trying, you know, you, you say, well, how did they know what they were saying in their little huddle? Well, you couldn't miss it, you know? How you gonna, how, what are they, they going to do, go to a closed room? There ain't no closed rooms. You know, the temple is a temple. It's meant for sacrifice. So they're in their huddle, and everybody's listening. And everybody's doing what? They're waiting for the answer. They're thinking, what are they going to say? And the press of the people, because all the people are saying, well, it's from God. It's from Aranos, right? And you notice what Jesus said. He didn't say, is it from God? He said it's from Aranos, which, by the way, includes what? Greek God. The Greeks, the Greeks and the Greek gods, and the Greek thought, right? Not to say that Jesus is saying there's Greek gods, but what he's doing is his message. He's probably said it loud enough so in the in the court of Gentiles, they heard it too, right? Yeah, if you can hear a coin drop, you can hear everything. There's, there's just beautiful stuff in here. So they answered, 33. They It says literally in the Greek, ap Trinomai, they concluded for themselves and legoed. I'm really sad that, that we skipped this. To Jesus. We don't know. Which is probably the least acceptable answer in Greek. What's the least of the least acceptable answers in Greek? Socrates even made a joke about it. I think not, Socrates. I think not. Remember? Think, I think not. In other words, he didn't think, and Socrates pounded him for not thinking. So at least they were thinking, but they said, we don't know. And Jesus lego, neither will I tell you by what authority, exusa, privilege, I am doing these things. But it goes on. This is chapter 12. He then began to lay low, to utter words to them in parables. Parabola. A parable is a lego with a single telos. And this is this is what he said. So um, is this all going on in the temple? <coughs> this, this is all going on in the temple. Jesus has stopped commerce. It's prob it, it is probably Passover. It is most likely Passover. It could be uh, Rosh Hashanah. It could be the... <coughs> It could be uh, uh, the festival of booze. It, you know, it's in that period, but it's most likely running up to the Passover. So people are buying their Passover lambs for the sacrifice. The sacrifices have stopped. Commerce has stopped. They can't move any currency. Jesus won't let them move any currency. And they're confronting Jesus in this temple filled with people. <clears throat> Think of all the, all the Levites are there. What, what can they not do? They can't do their temple stuff. I mean, they're supposed to be singing and lyring and, and, and selling and, you know, getting the... And, and they can't, right? <clears throat> and, and the place is full. We're going to see everybody's here. Everybody is brother and sister, his mother and his father because of what they say in, in the continuing things here. Why? I mean, what bugs me most about this is there's no transition. I mean, my time for English-trained mind is... How do we know? It, it, through the whole gospel, through all of them. I mean, it, it's story after story, <coughs> segment after segment, but it did an hour go by? Was it a day? Was it three days? Timeline. See, to the Greek mind, see, that this is what bothers us in English, and this is the thing. It's just like today in the gospel reading. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Well, we know that it wasn't just Mary Magdalene. But John just records Mary Magdalene, because why? 
That was the only thing that was important to John's Logos to tell us, because that's the way the Greeks did it. It doesn't mean there wasn't 50 people with her, right? Because that would be, in the Greek worldview, that's extraneous information. Who cares? You would expect right? to be a company. She wouldn't be alone. But in English, in English, we expect to know these things because we do that into a body conclusion and, and development of our writing. That's just the way we write. But in a, in a Greek text, it's not all like that. As a matter of fact, if you go look at any of the Socratic dialogues, they're painful sometimes. Some of them do tell you, you know, the time of day. They give you, uh, you know, the, the say, you know, the sun was high or la la la. But in general, you have no idea. Some of them are at, are at parties, and you only know it because there were notes in the margins or notes that were made that you know this was at a party or this was at a you know symposia. You know, or things like that. Or then another uh, dialogue actually says that this dialogue happened at a symposium. That's, all, that's the only way you know that dancing girls and things were happening and they were having drinks and, you know, having a great time, right? And, and still they had time for a dialogue. Because that's the way Greeks thought. See, like I said at the very beginning of class, you know, we imagine that the Greeks are doing something completely out of the, out of the weirdness, right, of this Logos to tell us view. But no. It's the way they talk. Oh, oh Mike, a beautiful, here, here's a, a, an analogy, almost the same. Anybody read a Victorian novel recently? <laughs> well, the way of speaking in a Victorian novel, right? It's odd to our ears. But you know what? People really did talk that way, right? How do you, how do you do? Would you like to come to tea, right? Let me introduce, right? And you never spoke to someone without an introduction. To us, that's odd. To their culture, that's normative. This is normative in the Greek culture. This whole way of thinking. This isn't something special that Mark whipped up. He's just repeating, and I think he's repeating direct dialogues of Christ. He's just selecting the dialogues that mean that he can fit within this Logos to tell us, to give us the most powerful message. That's the point, right? So it continues in 12. Then he began to Lelo. Lelo, not Logos. Lelo, uttered to them in parabola. Legos with a single telos. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall, a, thar uh, a thargmos, enclosed it. And what's really interesting, I gave you that word. I don't know if I put it in your text, but a uh, thargmos. The reason it's important is because the wall in the center of the temple that separated the temple was a meta uh, thargmos. It's a short wall. It's a small wall that prevented people from going across the temple. And Herod added to it and made it larger. So it's, that's just interesting that Jesus uses the same word as the word used for the enclosure around the temple. Um, he dug a pit for a wine press and built a watchtower, a, a pergos. Literally, he built a castle. In Greek, it's a castle, a pergos. He built a house, not just a watchtower. He built a place to stay. He rented the vineyard to some not farmers, the word is ger, ger orgos, workers of the gay. Workers of the gay. Which, by the way, a gergos is a farmer, but isn't it cool that the word is the workers of the gay? Remember, in Matthew, the gay is, is a bad thing. But in Mark, the gay is, is viewed neutrally, as a neutral thing. It's just the earth. But it's very interesting that <coughs> that the word is, I think the word is beautiful, workers of the gay, workers of the earth. And he went away on a journey. It should be obvious, the vineyard is the temple, Israel. The temple of Jerusalem, or Israel, represented by the house of Israel. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll hear that in a second. You'll, it, it'll tell you specifically. If you need to look more, look at Isaiah. And Mac, we will look at Isaiah. Uh, here's Isaiah, Isaiah 5, 1. <clears throat> I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower on it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now he dwells in Jerusalem, the men of, Judea, of Judah. Judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you that I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It will be destroyed. Hedge? Fence? 
I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, he saw bloodshed for righteousness, and heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house, and join field to field, till no space is left, and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions are without occupants, on and on and on. Look, everybody who heard Jesus say this knew he was talking about this. This is so obvious. I mean, it's like it was a quote, isn't it? Beautiful quote. I'll give you more. What's the first thing they did when they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem? Both times, every time. They broke down the wall. The reason is, it's, this is hugely important culturally. Because the temple in Jerusalem is like this with a wall. And the altar is here. And the holy place is here. There's also the brass uh, thing for washing your hands and feet. The problem with this temple is that in the Greek worldview, okay, here's a Greek temple. A Greek temple has the Greek temple. The God is here. This is where the God is. This is the entrance, and the altar is here. What is the problem to the, to the Greeks? The altar is inside the temple. That is an abomination to the Greeks. So the first thing the Greeks did when they destroyed the temple is they destroyed the mesocline. They, de they destroyed the mesophagus. They destroyed the, the wall around the temple on purpose because they could not have an altar inside of a temple. That is an abomination to the Greeks. So is it interesting that the thing that it says about, the, um, about it is they would destroy the hedge around the vineyard. And what's even more interesting is, you know, what's the first thing you do when you defeat a city in the ancient world? You destroy their defensive capability. Their wall. Yeah. You take down the wall. And that's what they had done to, that's what the Babylonians had done to Jerusalem. They had rebuilt the wall. The the Romans rebuilt the wall. The Romans destroyed the temple, they destroyed the temple wall, but not Jerusalem's wall. Why? They want they want a city. Yeah, they want a great defendable place. Anyway, there's more you can read it. Uh, about all kinds of neat stuff in there um, from Isaiah. Because remember, we're talking about rabbinic context. And guess what he's talking to, who he's talking to right now? They're a bunch of rabbis. And they're all Jewish, right? Two, at harvest time at Keros, the proper time, the proper season. Remember, it is not the proper season for figs. Hmm. At harvest time, the proper season, he sent a servant, a doulos. He didn't send a servant. He said a slave. It's doulos. Why do they translate it servant? I don't know. It's a slave. To the workers of the earth, the workers of gay, to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. In other words, he's taxing the vineyard. This is what they usually did. This is how they worked it out. But they seized the lambano. Do you hear this word? They lambano. I told you, lambano means to take. It's translated to seize. It is a very forceful word. You notice Jesus used the same word about, about praying or, or worshiping and taking, right? Taking the fruits of your worship. In other words, making it happen. Well, look what he used in this, in this context. Jesus said they lambano. They seized him. They flayed him and sent him away. And by the word, the word sent away is apostello. You know, I really, it, it's to me horrible that the word apostle, so common in the Greek to mean to send away, has become so meaningless in Christianity to only mean like disciples, like the disciples, when in reality we are all Apostello, right? The Apostello, empty handed. Kinos, okay, okay. Lionel, the alarm may not be going off because it's already 1047. It is, okay, very good. Anyway, we'll continue from there. I may be gone next week. I need to check and see because I'm supposed to go to uh, Tucson with Bill Mills, and I may be gone the week after. So I'll try to keep you informed through the uh, office and through what's happening. And then I'll definitely be gone the two weeks after that. So there may be a hiatus of four weeks. I'm sorry about that. 
Um, continue to look at this stuff. I mean, this is really neat things. And see what you can find for yourself within the English because it all fits. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen.